topic today is thinking forward. Okay, so as they say, you know, if you, if you don't look at history, you're condemned to make the, the mistakes of history. So let's look back at 2023. What were the consensus narratives in the market? Well, the first consensus was, well, interest rates were going to go through the roof and tech valuations were going to be smashed. What actually happened? Well, the Magnificent Seven collectively registered a 90% return over the year, just extraordinary. It's also the idea, is a very strong consensus, interest rates uh, coming up, the mortgage cliff, mortgages recessing, that there was going to be a big correction on the east coast of Australia. In fact, what happened? Property prices, thank God, went up 8% over the year. There was also consensus that lithium, one-way trade, EV revolution, going to the moon. What actually happened? Well, you know, the transition stalled a, a little bit to a degree. There was an oversupply. Lithium prices, uh, as of today, plummeted 80%. And uranium, who would have thought, has gone through the roof. Finally, there was the idea that there'd be a resurgent China coming out of COVID, bouncing back, but that didn't happen either. You know, that's been a, a faltering uh, economy that's, uh, and a bit of malaise has, has crept in. People are even comparing and saying, is there a valid comparison between Japan and, uh, and their lost decade of the 90s? So I guess the key lesson here is the macro and the geopolitical are extraordinarily difficult to get consistently right. Uh, when I was, I, was, I was doing this presentation, I couldn't help thinking uh, of, I don't know if there's any Seinfeld uh, fans in the room, and the great George Costanza, where you know, he's, a, he's a bit of a um, stuff up in life. Everything he does is wrong. And Jerry, his best mate, says to him, he goes, George, every instinct that you have is wrong. Just do the opposite, and you'll do amazing. And 2023 would have been a very good year for the Costanza strategy. Uh, so what do we do? Well, instead of trying to predict the geopolitical and the macro, we instead concentrate on just good old-fashioned, bottom-up stock selection. Specifically, what we're looking for in the Plato Global Alpha Fund is the very best of value, growth, and quality out of a broad universe of 10,000 companies globally. The strategy is a 150-50 strategy. So what does this mean? Uh, you, many of you will be familiar with these types of strategies. It means we've got 50% more firepower on the long side to invest in our best ideas. But we've also got this second alpha engine, this 50% short book to generate alpha. And we've actually generated 70 to 80% of our alpha to date through our shorts. And I'll go into a bit more detail exactly how we make that happen in a moment. Uh, a second key pillar of everything we do at Plato is the red flags. We've got over 100 codified red flags that we look at before we make any investment on the long side. Uh, so you put these different building blocks together, and as Adam said, we've, uh, it's translated to a 32.3% return last year. The annualized return since inception, we're coming up to our three-year number, 8.7% uh, over the benchmark after fees. Uh, this year, it's uh, got off to a flying start. We're up about 11.5% year to date. So I spoke about the best of value, best of growth, best of quality. Well, uh, you know, every now and then you find a company that is a great quality company at a fair price. But even rarer, you come across a company that is an outstanding company at a knockdown price. And that's what BMW is for me. Trades at a PE of just five times earnings. Okay. Uh, if you think of a domestic example, you know, the, you know what Domino's Pizza you can pick up for 25 times. The reject shop you can pick up internationally for about 25 times. BMW you can pick up at five times earnings. People might say, well, they're not growing in the EV space like, like your Tesla's. Well, they are actually. They're actually growing their EV range at 100% a year. They sell more EVs than Rivian, GM, and Ford combined. So that's a fantastic opportunity. It's a growth story, but it's that incredible value for this storied automaker. So a growth example. Last year, when I, I stood uh, at the, the Insights uh, series, I, I spoke about Novo Nordisk. 
and these incredible weight loss drugs that are, are now firmly in the public consciousness are, are Zempic. And that's a name that we'd owned for two years and we still continue to own. But they're, they're pretty richly priced at this point. So what's, what's going to be the next Azempic? What's going to be the next great story over the next 12 months? Well, Vertex Pharma, American company, it's not a spivvy little biotech. They throw off $4 billion a year in free cash flow on their revolutionary cystic fibrosis treatment that have extended the life expectancy of that awful condition from 27, about 20 years ago, now to well into the 50s. Probably the, one of the most exciting things about this story with Vertex is they've just uh, gone through phase two trials with a new pain medication. And if you like a, a good binge uh, like I do, you probably would have seen your painkiller, your dope sick, these series. And uh, you know, basically demonstrating how entire communities and families this opioid epidemic is laid waste to. So the world is crying out for an alternative to opioids. Um, but it's not there. For every 100 Americans, there's 40 opioid prescriptions written every year. Um, this has been a bit of a graveyard for pharma companies. A lot of people have tried to, to solve this problem, get something that's entirely non-addictive but as effective as opioids, but Vertex are looking very, very close. And uh, that could uh, be redefining for the, for the next 12 months, 24 months uh, and beyond. So Microsoft is a, is a name that we all, all know well, and uh, you know, a lot of people associated Microsoft with Tech 1.0, but they really are in the driving seat in the age of, of AI. Uh, I'll talk about Copilot. Has, has anyone in the room used Copilot? Um, yeah, a few people. So Copilot is, uh, uh, if you can remember, back, cast your mind back, say, 25 years ago to, that, to Clippy, that little clip that uh, sat in your Microsoft that could help do basically nothing. Well, this is Copilot will change your life. If you are starting a new advisory practice and you want to launch a new website, then Jot down half a page of bullet points, the look and feel of the website, how you want it to perform, the features. 10 seconds later, you've got the Java code generated to deploy that website. Uh, say that you need help with your um, statements of advice for clients. That's a, a huge time consuming um, task. Copilot can help automate that to a very large degree. Of course, you know, it needs the, the human hand on the tiller after the fact, but it can take a, away a lot of that grunt work. So you put together the best of value, the best of growth, and the best of quality. That gives us those nice all-weather smooth returns that we're looking for, whether value is in favor. So in the first 18 months of the fund's life, it was a value market, it was a bear market, and we're consistently, month after month, adding value over and above the market. Fast forward to a tech, AI frenzy driven market, and we're still outperforming consistently, month after month. So that's really our, our true north, to try and deliver those all weather returns. Now in fact, of course, nothing is all weather, there's always gonna be periods where we're going to underperform, but that's how we're trying to construct the portfolio so we're not held hostage to one, any one regime or, or thematic. So I mentioned the, the red flags, and, and this is a, a little bit corny, if you forgive me, but uh, the great Warren Buffett uh, is always fond of saying that there's only two things you need to know in investment. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And that's what the red flags is really all about. Uh, so the, what are some of the red flags that we look at before we make any investment, long or short? Who's the auditor? Are there directors suddenly unloading stock? Um, what's the hedge fund community saying? Um, are there signs of very aggressive revenue recognition? Um, when you put all of these different eclectic red flags together, what you see is if a company has eight or more red flags, our research indicates that over um, the next 12 months, that company, on average, will underperform the market by about 20%. So that's a really, really big number. And this is one of the key tools we use to avoid landmines on the long side of our portfolio, but also to generate fantastic alpha on the short side of our portfolio. 
Uh, a case in point, I guess, uh, is Lion Town, a recent one. It was a name we were already short. We had uh, some concerns over their ability to, to execute. And then we noticed uh, just after Christmas, their CEO unloaded a million dollars of stock. Okay. And that's uh, what made that particularly unusual is most of the time when CEOs and insiders unload stock is after a period of great strength, a bit of profit taking. But that wasn't the case with Liontown. The stock price had already been pummeled and suddenly the CEO is unloading a sizable portion. Okay, so that increased our short conviction. Sure enough, a few weeks later, all of their, their debt financing falls through and the stock price falls 25%. Now, we've spoken about the, the macro and how difficult it is to predict, but that certainly doesn't mean it should ever be ignored. Quite the contrary. So this is a, a snapshot of PRISM, which is our proprietary software that we use to track 75 different stress tests on our portfolios every single day, much in the same way as a bank will stress test their portfolio. So if, for example, Chinese property um, gets smashed, what happens? If lithium has a really, really strong run, what happens to our portfolio in basis points? Uh, if Donald Trump gets elected, how's our portfolio likely to behave? So this is the way that we try and ensure that we're not taking any undue risks uh, in the portfolio, try and deliver those smooth returns through time. So you put those different building blocks together and as uh, Adam mentioned, we've outperformed by almost 9% per annum uh, since inception. Upside and downside capture are very strong, so we're doing better than the market and up markets, but when markets are down, we're preserving your capital better. This translates to very smooth performance, which is the, the dark line of the fund relative to the benchmark. Those faded lines are the household name uh, funds are in the market. So we're getting that nice, smooth trajectory that I think investors are increasingly looking for. A very valid point may be, well, Dave, this, uh, this fund is just coming up to its three-year anniversary. Has it been through multiple cycles? Is this performance repeatable? Well, probably the best way for me to, to answer that, I was at, at JP Morgan in London for 15 years, and uh, I was running a 5 billion euro European 13030 strategy, and in that strategy, over that decade, we outperformed by 4% per annum, and again, had very smooth returns in green over the cycle. So I, I feel like I've stitched myself up here a little bit, because uh, Pinnacle asked that each presenter finish with three bold predictions for, for next year or for, for this year. And I've also I basically said that making predictions on the macro and the geopolitical is exceedingly difficult. So with that said, uh, you know, what can we say is going to be a big driver, big points of contention this year? Well, uh, as I, I think I said in the opening video, actually, uh, there's uh, a huge amount of um, really important elections hap happening this year. I think 80, 85% of the world's democracies are going to the polls this year. What are the important ones? Well, in the US, let's just assume that both uh, candidates are alive this time next year. Um, but uh, if Trump gets elected, very likely that there's going to be an aggressive trade war with China. That could be very inflationary, and that could increase interest rates and cause a big switch from, value, from growth into value. If Biden was to win, I think it's a, it's a fair bet that the other side are not going to accept that result lying down. In terms of, in terms of global conflict, there's actually been a 40% increase in global conflict since 2000. Okay? And uh, you know, what other conflict are, are the big drivers that, that concern us, that, that keep us awake at night? Well, you know, heaven forbid that... Uh, China becomes a lot more aggressive in terms of Taiwan, but it certainly wouldn't be the first time that uh, a superpower, once their domestic economy is flagging a little bit, look to uh, a foreign incursion to, to distract from the home front. So putting it all together, I'm, a, I'm slightly over time. Key is for us, we'll, we'll block out the macro noise, but be very um, sensitive to the macro risks that are present in our portfolio and control those different risks. Always have the best of value, growth, quality in the portfolio at all times. 
use the red flags to preserve capital, generate some alpha for you on the short side, and that ultimately is translated into to very strong returns, that, which we anticipate uh, should continue. Thank you.